What does it take to define an era? How about completely rewriting the visual rules of Marvel's favorite hero? Or creating the most popular character of the last 25 years? Well, that's exactly what Todd McFarlane did on The Amazing Spider-Man. Carbon scoring here. Looks like you boys have seen a lot of action. Hey y'all, and welcome back to Carbon Scoring, the best place for comics history and action figures. We've been looking at the action figure history of Spider-Man, and we've been doing it through the lens of the creators who brought these incredible characters to life. We've studied Sturdy Steve Ditko and Jazzy Johnny Romita. We've gone through the 1970s of Gil Kane and Ross Andrew, as well as the 1980s of John Romita Jr. and Ron Friends. These creators added their own unique style when drawing the webhead, and they each brought new characters into the fold, some memorable and others not so much. Steve Ditko co-created Spider-Man and defined his visual look. He started out as a really skinny teenager, lithe and gangly. And this is what we've seen in action figure form as well. The versions of Spider-Man labeled as first appearance are typically that, they represent the look of Spidey as he appeared on the cover of Amazing Fantasy 15. But over his three-year run, Steve Ditko's look for Spider-Man changed and evolved. He remained a nimble contortionist, always able to bend and twist into iconic spidery poses, the soles of his feet pointed at the reader. But Spidey's frame became more muscular and athletic as he went on. Many people comment that when John Romita Sr. took over the book, he made Spidey more heroic, with a more classic comic book frame. And that's certainly true, especially compared to the earliest Ditko issues. But I'd argue that the style shift wasn't as dramatic as it's often portrayed. Likewise, every artist on the title for the next 20 years took their cue from Romita. His was the house style, the defined Marvel look for Spider-Man. It really wasn't until Ron Friends in the mid-1980s leaned heavily into the early Ditko look that an artist really changed things up. Then came Todd McFarlane. Todd took over the art chores on Amazing Spider-Man with issue 298 in March of 1988. It was a seismic shift and rocked not only the Spider-Man titles, but comics as a whole for years to come. But where did this guy come from? And how did his Spider-Man come out basically fully formed from the get-go? McFarlane was born in Calgary, Canada and played collegiate baseball at Eastern Washington University while working at a comic shop to make ends meet. Trying to find his way into comics, he entered over 700 submissions to Marvel and DC before finally being offered a four-page backup story in Epic Comics Coyote. The art was still rough, but some classic McFarlane elements were there from the very beginning. This led to a two-year run on Infinity Incorporated, as well as a three-issue stint on Detective Comics. Then he moved over to Marvel for an epic run on Hulk with Peter David, before landing the Spidey gig. Man, he hit the ground running. This is the very first full image of Spider-Man drawn by Todd McFarlane in issue 298. In this one panel are the three features that set Todd Spidey apart. Spaghetti webbing, huge eyes, and total disregard for human anatomy. Let's take a look at each of these in more detail. First up, the webs. Known as spaghetti webbing, Todd drew these intricate web lines, coiled and tangled and almost alive. It allowed him to play with perspective, to have the webs blasting out of the page right at you. In an interview in Comics Interview issue 81, Todd said, That crazy webbing? I actually can't take credit for that. The webbing idea came from an old black and white piece that was The Defenders by Michael Golden. And for whatever reason, he had Spider-Man in it. He did this great Spider-Man with this funky webbing, and I go, if I ever turn into a comics pro and get to do Spider-Man, I'm going to do webbing like that. So while Todd may have been inspired by the genius of Michael Golden, he certainly took it to another level and made the spaghetti webs his own. The second and perhaps most lasting change Todd made was to Spidey's eyes. He started drawing these huge eyes. They basically took up the entire mask. They even made fun of it in a meta way in issue 313, when the Spider-Man Macy's balloon becomes possessed. 
After our Spidey punctures and deflates it, he crawls from below thinking, ah, his eyes were all wrong anyway. While there were examples of the eyes being used in expressive ways previously, I think the big eye trend dates back to Art Adams for Spider-Man's brief appearance in his Longshot miniseries in 1985. Adams has become another comics legend, and here we can see he was not only using the Michael Golden webs, but he began the look of expanding Spidey's eyes. Again, while there may have been precursors, Todd's eyes were so unique, and they became a defining part of his look for Spider-Man. And finally, there is the blatant disregard for human anatomy in the best interest of storytelling. Here's one of Todd's most famous covers for Amazing Spider-Man. And here's my attempt to get Hasbro's super articulated figures into that same pose. Without using Photoshop, there's just no way to do it. Legs and arms simply don't go into those places. You, you just can't do it. Trust me, I've broken two Mafex Spider-Man figures just trying to make this video. But my point here is not to criticize. It's actually to applaud this. Yes, Todd drew Spidey in impossible positions, but that was the entire point. Ditko famously contorted Spidey's body around, giving the webhead a unique visual look. Todd took those same principles and went to the next level, but he did it in a way that still looked natural. This is comic storytelling at its finest. Let me put this another way. When Michelangelo's statue of David was first revealed, a contemporary reviewer in the early 1500s said that it had ruined the art of sculpture because it was so perfect that future artists would have to go through exaggerated extremes trying to top it. I think the same thing happened when future artists tried to out McFarlane McFarlane. Yeah, I just compared Todd McFarlane to Michelangelo. So with Spidey's look revolutionized, it was time for McFarlane's greatest contribution to Spidey's rogues gallery. Sticks and stone were equal parts. What's that? We're not, we're not talking about sticks and stone? Venom? Oh. Let's roll it back. All the way back to the Secret Wars. Spidey rips up his suit during the battle, so a fancy machine gives him a new one. And bonus, it is super cool and responds to his thoughts. Now Pete can wear anything that he thinks of. And he still chooses to dress like a hobo. But the suit is taking Spidey for joy rides at night while he's asleep. Seeking answers, Spidey asks Mr. Fantastic to analyze the suit. Surprise! It's alive. They trap it, and the amazing Bagman is born. Meanwhile, Eddie Brock is an investigative reporter for the Daily Globe, whose biggest expose gets spoiled by Spider-Man, ruining his career. The symbiote breaks free, Eddie contemplates suicide, their mutual hatred of Spidey joins them together, and... Voila! Venom. Writer David Michelini had the unique idea of a villain who was Spidey's mirror opposite. But it was McFarlane's haunting design that instantly made Venom one of Spidey's greatest foes. Toy Biz and Hasbro may have made one or two Venom figures over the years. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. Toy Biz's first Venom was this lunk here. It wasn't so bad, but the articulation was kind of wonky. They definitely upped their game with their next offering in 1992. A much more comic accurate sculpt combined with functional articulation made for a great figure. Plus, how could you not love this? The Spider-Man animated series debuted in 1994 and Venom was prominently featured. This figure has a pretty sweet trick. The rubbery mask came off to reveal an animated Eddie Brockhead beneath. As Venom evolved in the comics, he evolved in the action figure aisles as well. Both Toy Biz and Hasbro created more and more monstrous versions of the character, as you can see here. The more hulking physiques, the bigger and more grotesque tongue action. The sculpting on these figures is excellent, without sacrificing articulation. This led to the biggest Venom figures ever produced, with the Monster Venom Build-A-Figure in 2018 and the Deluxe version coming in 2020. These things are massive, and 
still pretty accurate with the way Venom has been drawn in the books lately. But while some people love their Venom to be on the huge side, I've always preferred my Venom to look like the early McFarlane issues that we've just gone through. Hasbro has also given us this much more McFarlane-esque version back in 2018. I love that you can switch the head sculpts out so that you can display them in multiple different formats. This might have been my favorite Venom figure, if it had not been for this one. The Venom produced by Toy Biz in the initial lineup of Spider-Man classics back in 2000. This figure truly captures what it must have been like for the symbiote to truly engulf you. The details in the sculpt, from Eddie's smiling face being swallowed, to the creeping black as it spreads over his legs, this figure is simply a masterpiece, and it was so far ahead of its time. This one still holds the top spot for me. Todd had the art chores on Amazing Spider-Man from March of 1998 to January of 1990, a time span of only 22 months. But he illustrated 26 full issues due to the summer bi-weekly schedule at the time. This was an unbelievable work rate given the detail he was placing on the book. Critics would claim that aside from the Venom issues, there really wasn't a classic storyline that is fondly remembered. Who cares? It looked that good. Todd would go on to do 15 issues of Adjectiveless Spider-Man, but that's a whole nother video. And he'd be replaced on Amazing by Eric Larson whose contributions we'll see in the next video in our series, looking at all the characters, figures, and creators of everybody's favorite webhead. Until then, check out some of our other great videos. And don't forget to like and subscribe to Carbon Scoring.